I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is where we are, uh, continuing our all-in series. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier with the kids, uh, it is a kind of a wild weekend. We've got, uh, you know, 190 people at family camp, another 40 ladies on a women's retreat. It is a, uh, it's a busy, busy uh, kind of time. So I'm glad you're here. And uh, sometimes it feels like uh, all of our leaders go uh, different directions, but uh, I appreciate that, uh, that you're here and you want to hear from God today. So uh, we are concluding our All In series today, and, and the last few weeks we have been challenging you to go all in with your relationship with Jesus and in following Christ. Uh, we've been challenging you to, you to go all in on the mission of life change, uh, to help with us with leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Uh, we've invited you to go all in with generous giving, supporting the mission of Christ and the new Sweetwater Worship Center uh, that we're working on even as we speak. So today I want to address the question, what happens when we go all in? What results from an all-in commitment to Christ? Uh, and, and I was thinking about this because, you know, we get the term all-in from gambling, right? It, it's a term that's used a lot in poker. Any poker players out there? <laughs> You're like, I ain't raising my hand. I'm in church. <laughs> Can I raise my hand? Are they going to call me out? So any other poker players out there? Yeah, you know, okay. So th- thank you. So, uh, so all in, when you're, when you're, you know, playing poker and you go all in, it means that you put all your chips in the bet. You, you're like, uh, I, you know, they're all on the table and you are committed. You're, you know, you're, you're betting it all on the hand that you have is going to beat the other people's hands. And so one of two things can happen when you go all in. What are those two things? Yeah. You're either going to win big or you're going to lose everything. It, it's very risky, you know, unless, you know, unless you've got a for sure winning hand, which usually you don't. And, and so you're in that place where you're gambling, you're risking whether or not you're going to win. Uh, now, I love this picture that's behind the, the sermon series uh, of that guy jumping off the cliff. Any cliff jumpers in here? Yeah. Oh, okay, more than poker players. What can I say? Okay, there's only like six people. Right How many of you have ever jumped off of a cliff or, or something like that? Okay, see, a lot more hands go up. What, what is, I used to jump off of cliffs, no more. <laughs> see, because when you jump off a cliff, one of three things is going to happen. You know, if you do it right, you're going to jump off the cliff. You're going to land in the water. It's going to be an exhilarating, exciting experience. You're going to pop up out of that water and shouting and going, yeah, I want to do this again. Or... You can jump off that cliff, land incorrectly in the water, face plant, do a belly flop, back buster, experience a great amount of pain. All your friends watching are going to groan with you when you hit the water. And then once you come up and they see that you're alive, they're going to laugh at you repeatedly. (laughs) And you're going to probably say, I'm not doing that again. Now, the third thing that can happen when you jump off a cliff is, you know, you can jump in the wrong place and you can land on something that isn't water and it can hurt you greatly or you can die, which is why my mom used to always say when we would go cliff jumping, uh, don't uh, come cl- complaining to me if you die. So uh, <laughs> I always thought that was an interesting kind of concept, so I always promised my mom that I wouldn't. So uh, now here's the thing. We're, we're not challenging you today to uh, play poker or to jump off a cliff. Some of you are thankful for that. We are challenging you to go all in in following Christ. All in in following Christ. So what happens, what results from an all-in commitment to God? The Apostle Paul addresses that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, I want to pick up in verse 6 uh, where, we, where we started a couple of weeks ago. And just let you hear these words again in the whole context. The apostle says, by the way, if you don't have a Bible with you and you're wondering where we are, 2 Corinthians uh, 9 is on page 1,231. The Pew Bibles look just like this one. Grab one of those, 1,231. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul says, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. 
As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of the service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. I hope you can see that when you go all in with God, there is absolutely no risk. No risk. Because when we follow Jesus in cheerful generosity, grace abounds to us. Grace abounds. Did you catch that in verse 8? And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So when we follow Jesus, when we go all in, grace abounds. And and that is awesome because I like grace. I like grace a lot. Anybody with me on that one? Yeah. You see, here's the thing about grace. I deserve hell. I know that Chad Garrison deserves hell because I've rebelled against God, I've sinned, I've been selfish, uh, I've done things my way instead of God's way, and and the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So I deserve hell, and yet because of grace, because of the gift of God through Jesus Christ of eternal life, even though I deserve hell, I'm going to heaven. Not because of who Chad Garrison is, but because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's what we get all excited about. And the same is true for you if you're a follower of Jesus. So if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus with your life, even though you deserve hell, you're going to get heaven. I mean, that's something to be excited about. I love grace. It it, it is the the best thing ever. But it doesn't just apply to salvation. Grace isn't just about getting us to heaven. It is about daily living in that abundant grace that God gives us. You know what it means to live in grace? It means that you live every single day knowing that you are forgiven. That you are forgiven. You see, Satan loves to pour guilt on us. And you just thought it was your mom, right? Now, I'm not saying that Satan is your mom, all right, so, or that your mom is Satan. You can say that. I can't. So, uh, so here's the thing. Satan wants to load us down with guilt. All of us have made mistakes. All of us have things in the past we wish we hadn't done. And a lot of us are carrying those around, feeling like it disqualifies us from God really liking us. And that's not what grace means. Grace means that you understand that the moment you confess your sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's his promise. So living in that grace that abounds to us is accepting that truth and allowing God's forgiveness to wash over you. So you don't live in guilt. You don't live in shame. You don't live carrying around that remorse of what you wish you'd done because you know that God can redeem and he has a future for you. Living with that that abundant grace means that, that, well, you know that God is for you and not against you. That that God wants to lead your life to blessings, to hope, to peace, uh, to to just joy. And and that you don't have to fear, oh, God's going to be angry at me all the time. No, God loves you. He's for you. Living with that abundant grace in your everyday life means that you tap into God's eternal purpose. That God invites us in as he's changing the world and he's changing lives. And he says, you can come be a part of this. You see, grace is so much about how it affects our lives and our relationships right now. So grace abounds when we go all in. And Paul says specifically, two areas of life are affected by this outpouring of God's grace that he mentions here in the text. The first area of life that results from God's grace abounding to us, is contentment. Contentment. When we go all in following Jesus, we experience contentment. Look at verse 8 again. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, listen to this, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times. All sufficiency, all things, all times. You know what that means? God's going to give you enough. He's going to give you enough always so that you can be content. So what this is saying is if you want to be content, generosity is a necessity. 
It's absolutely necessary. The more generous you are, the more contentment is going to abound in your life. Um, See, discontentment occurs when we fixate on the things that we don't have and we want. Think about this. You, you become discontent on the inside when you look around and you say, I don't have that and I want that. Uh, by the way, this is what all marketing is based on. Creating in you a desire to want something that you do not need so that you think that you need it so that you work to get it, right? It's like you're sitting there watching TV and a Domino's commercial comes on. What do you want? Yeah, pizza. And they will bring it to you. You don't even have to get off your couch. Right? This is so easy. I want pizza. I'm not hungry, but I want pizza. But and it's bigger things than that. It's new cars. It's houses. It's, you know, clothes. It's vacations. I want it. I, I need that. I want, and so it creates this discontent in us because we want something we don't have. And it might be a relationship, and it might be, uh, you know, a job. It might be something else. We go, I want that. And so it, discontent grows in us. The other thing that breeds discontent is the fact that we have something and we become afraid that we're going to lose it. We have something, we're afraid we're going to lose it. This is the, we do this with our stuff, right? Because we have houses and we have stuff in our houses and we don't want anyone to get it, so what do we have on our doors? Lock. Yeah, we lock our houses. That's not enough. <laughs> it's not enough that you lock your houses. Then you got to put a security system on it, right? And then it's not enough to have a security system. you got to own a weapon so that if somebody breaks in, you can shoot them. See, because we like our stuff and we're afraid somebody's going to come take our stuff. And then because our houses aren't big enough for our stuff, what do we build? Garages. Yeah, bigger houses. Now you got a garage because you got more stuff that used to park outside back in the day. And now it's like, nope, somebody's going to mess with my stuff, so I'm going to lock it up. And you are, how many of you have garages bigger than your houses? <laughs> a few of you do. Thank you for confessing. The others of you, I'm not confessing that. You know, I want a garage bigger than my house, but, I, you know, and, and so, so we do this because we're discontent. That fear of losing something that we have or that, that fixation of wanting something that we don't have. And, uh, and here's what, how contentment occurs. Contentment occurs when we focus on God's blessings and the joy of sharing God's blessings. That's where contentment comes from. When we wake up in the morning and we realize how blessed we are and how much God has given to us, and we are thankful for that, and we think, oh, wow, God's blessed me so much, I need to share that with other people. And, and the thing that fixes this uh, and really changes our life is when we realize that because we live in the United States of America, every person in this room is wealthier than 98% of the world. 98% of the world has less than you do. And, and here's our problem. We look at the 2% who have more, and we want that. See, that's discontent. That's what, that's what our culture is fixated on, focusing on the people who have more than us so that we want that, and we work for that, we borrow for that, and all that kind of stuff. And so if we wake up and we realize, God, look at how much you've given me, and thank you, and look at all these people who need more, and I want to share, I want to bless, I want to help them, that leads us to a place of contentment. So are you living a contented life? So that grace abounds to contentment and that grace abounds resulting in impact. Impact. Uh, again, I just want to finish verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Purpose. Purpose. God's grace allows us to make a difference in this world. Isn't that cool? Again, we're not talking about, you know, self-promoting, hey, I'm going to build my resume and I'm going to accomplish these things and get all these accolades and have my PR department, you know, shine me up so that I look good to the world. No, we're talking about wanting to see God's kingdom come, His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Kind of like we pray. And so when you go all in on God's mission, God's grace abounds to you, and God uses you to change lives, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, changes them for all eternity. Your life becomes a powerful force in the hands of God. Now, I know some of you are like me. You, you uh, go online, and you read the news, and you see what's happening in the world, and let's just face it, it kind of depresses you, right? 
Because you look at it and you go, this is crazy over here and it's crazy over here and it's crazy in our country and people are making decisions I don't like and I wish I could change it and I can't and we feel powerless and that's frustrating. So turn the news off and realize that God has not called me or you to change the world. That's his job. You know what he's called us to do? We can change the world for one person. Every one of you in here has the power to change the world for one person. The way you love, the way you live, the way you treat them, the way you help them. You can change the world for one person. Everyone in this room can change the world for their family. Do you realize that family is the first responsibility that God entrusted to us? And if you will love your family the way that God's called you to love them, and you will serve them, and you will care for them, it will change the world for your family. Do you realize that you can change the, well, maybe not the world, but you can change this community? I know some of you are going, oh, that's too big, Pastor. I can't change this community. Yeah, you can. Don't you think that Calvary is having an impact on Lake Havasu City? Yeah. See, I do. I I see the lives that are being changed. I see the families that are being redeemed. I see the the people who are getting free from from addictions. I see the the power of God to change lives. And, And it's not because of me and it's not because of any one person. It's because of us. The family of God at Calvary who is going out into the community, who is loving people in Jesus' name, who is serving people in Jesus' name, who is representing Christ in their character day in and day out at the grocery store and and at the the markets and all the different places that you go, that's what's making an impact. So guys, we can't change the world, but we are changing our corner of it to the glory of God. And he is celebrating, and you are a part of that when you go all in on God's mission. By the way, that's why we invite and encourage you to serve. We want everyone to serve because when we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, he lifts us up. He exalts us in his time and in his way. Uh, So when we go all in, grace abounds, giving you the, the ability to make an impact, giving you contentment. And here's the second part of this. When, when we go all in, God gives us more. God gives us more. This is kind of crazy. Look at verse 10. It's talking about God when it says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Okay, you read that and you see supply and multiply. God will supply and he will multiply it. It's kind of a cool concept, isn't it? Uh, Now at this point, I just going to confess something. Maybe some of you struggle with the same thing that I do. But I confess that uh, I struggle with greed. Anybody else struggle with, with wanting to be greedy? Okay. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you struggle with lying? <laughs> just, just, just wondering. Because I, I want stuff, and then I get stuff, and I want to hold on to that stuff. And, and I don't want to be that way. I don't want to be a greedy person. I don't want to love things or, or have a hold on to this stuff and keep it for myself and use it for myself. I don't want to be that selfish, greedy person. So what I do to confront that urge to be greedy is I give generously. I give generously. That's God's prescription for, for dealing with the greed within us is to give it away, to, to share it with other people. And so I give generously to confront the selfishness in me. And then you know what happens because I give generously? God gives more. Yeah, that's what he does. God gives more. He blesses. And, and I sit here before you just confessing, I'm a blessed man. And incredibly blessed. But here's the other thing. Even as blessed as I am, I keep asking God for more blessings. Anybody with me on that? Yeah. See, we all do. We all know we're blessed, but what do we do? God, would you please bless more? Would you bless my family, my friends, my my church? Uh, Just, you know, bless. And and here's the thing. God gives more blessings. He gives more blessings. Why does he do that? Because he wants to increase the harvest of righteousness. That's what he tells us, right? In verse 10, he's going to supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You see, we're blessed because when we go all in and live life on God's terms, he loves to bless his children. He tells us that back up in verse 7, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so we practice generosity. God goes, hey, that's my child. I'm going to give him more stuff. I'm going to keep pouring the blessings on. And and so increase the harvest equals more. That supply and multiply. And in fact, when I was thinking about supply and multiply, you know what came to mind? 
the, the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. You guys know this story? It's in, it's in all the Gospels. He's, he's out there with a bunch of people on the hillside, and uh, they've been there all day listening to him teach, and the disciples come and say, Jesus, you better send them home because they're, they're probably hungry, and we don't want them to pass out on the way home, so they need to go to the villages and get food to eat. And Jesus freaks out his followers, and he goes, you feed them. Now, just imagine, if you will, a deer-in-the-headlight moment for the apostles. Because they're like, uh, Jesus, we can't feed them. It would cost all these thousands of denarii, and we don't have that kind of money, and there's no marketplace to go and buy bread so that everyone could even have a bite. All we have is this, this kid's lunch. Give me your lunch, kid. <laughs> oh, no. Kid was like going, hey, you can have my lunch, uh, which is really cool of the kid. But they go, all we have is this, this lunch, loaves and fishes. That, that's it. And what does Jesus do with that supply? He multiplies it so that thousands of people are fed out of one kid's lunch. That's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to take that little that we have and he wants to multiply it to increase the harvest of righteousness. But notice that harvest of righteousness does not equal money. See, this is where some preachers go off the rails. Because they'll tell you that if you're generous and you give to God, God will give you more money. And what I'm going to tell you is if you're generous and you give to God, God will bless the socks off. But it's not necessarily going to be with cash. You see, God blesses us how he decides. We decide the measure of blessing. God decides the method of blessing. Uh, I already told you I'm incredibly blessed. Uh, just so much, if you, you know, we sit down for a couple hours, I'll explain all the ways God has blessed me. But I am not wealthy by U.S. standards. Why is that? I mean, because I already told you I give generously to God. Why am I not wealthy by uh, American standards? Honestly, it's because I would not be as effective for the kingdom of God if I was filthy rich. And I know this because I've offered to God many times. He can make me filthy rich, Right? Am I the only one who's ever asked God to do that? Yeah, because we, we all have sometimes, God, I really need more. And, you know, and I've, and I've had that conversation with God, you know, filling out the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes stuff. Back in the day when it was paper and not just online, you know, and you had to go through that stuff and mail it in. and I, You know, thinking, okay, God, if you let me win this, I'll give most of it to you. Well, I'll keep some for me, just enough to make me ridiculously comfortable. But, uh, you know, and, and see, so I've made those offerings to God, and God has decided that Chad Garrison would be less effective for his kingdom if I had too many resources. So God has provided enough, and he's blessed me. Actually, I've had more than I need. I've had plenty, but it's not a ridiculous abundance because God is more interested in increasing my harvest of righteousness than he is in increasing my bank account. And my guess is the same applies to you. Now, I'm praising God for his wisdom because he's smarter than me. Are you able to do that in your life too? Are you able to say thank you, God, for what you supply and how you multiply and how you bless? Because God wants to give us more. He gives us more to increase the harvest of righteousness, and he gives us more so that we can be generous. I love it when scriptures are black and white, where you can't really argue with it. So listen to verse 11, because this is where the Apostle Paul kind of gets out a hammer and talks to us. He says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. There's just not a lot of ambiguity there, is there? I mean, however God blesses you, it is so you can share the blessings. So if we come to God and we say, God, I, I, I want you to bless me, and God pours out his blessings on us, and we have all these blessings, what does he want us to do with them? He wants us to share them. And then we come back to God, and he blesses us more so that we can share them. And then God, we come back to God, and he blesses us more. And this time we decide, I think I'll hang on to these. I like these blessings. And then we come back to God, and what can God give us? Nothing. Because our hands are full. You see, God has enriched us in every way so that we can be generous in every way. So however God has blessed you, it is so that you can share the blessings. So if you are a talented musician, 
It is so that you can play and sing and lead others in worship of God. I mean, aren't you guys thankful that our team does that, our worship team? You know, they do a great job, even though half of them were gone today. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah. Love those guys. And, and, and if you are a happy people person, then, and you just love to see people, whether you know them or not, then it, maybe it's so that you can be on our first impressions team, what we used to call our greeters. Because we want happy, friendly people at the door to say hi to people when they come in. We're expecting thousands of guests when we move into our Sweetwater campus, and we want the friendliest, happiest, most excited people to be there at the door. So if you and your group of friends, if they would all, if, if they're figuring out which of the you know, seven dwarves you are, if they would say you're happy or even dopey, um, then, <laughs> then we want you on our first impressions team. On the other hand, if they would say you're grumpy, no, that is not the place for you. Hey, welcome to Calvary. Get in there and get your seat, but not mine. <laughs> not what we're looking for, really. Or if you love people and you love to see them grow in their faith and you are comfortable leading a discussion, we need life group leaders. Yeah, life group leaders. See, there's a, a lot of you that are in life groups that, you know, you're entirely capable of leading a group and, and God's kind of been nudging you, speaking to you, and, and you're like, no, God, I don't want to do that. I, I like where I'm at. Listen to God. Or, or maybe some of you are sitting there and you're not in a life group, but you've led small groups before and you're comfortable leading a discussion about Scripture and you love people and you're hospitable. And, and, and uh, honestly, you need to have a conversation with Pastor Chet or with Mike Wilkinson who heads up our life groups because we're expecting God to send us all these people. Guess what? We need groups for them to connect with. Life groups. Or, or let's just say uh, God has blessed you and you love children and children like you. Because if you love kids and all you do is make them scream, no. But if you love kids and kids like you, then we could use you to help out in our nursery ministry. Because someone's taking care of the babies. And we need moms and grandmas and grandpas and dads that, that love kids to, to give a, a week, a month, or, or a once a, a quarter to go in there and love kids so the parents can come in here and hear the Word of God. Or maybe to volunteer with uh, Julie and Jam. You know, you've got the giftedness and you love kids, uh, then talk to her. And if God has blessed you with the ability to make lots of money, it's so that you can be extremely generous. That's reality. Last week, we shared with you these all-in commitment cards. And if you weren't here last week, that's okay. They're in your bulletin this week. And we've invited you as part of Calvary family to help support the Sweetwater Worship Center. And we shared this with you, not because God needs your money or the church needs your money, but because we want to give you that opportunity to practice generosity towards a life-changing ministry called Calvary. And, and, uh, and what we're asking you to do is take this and pray about it and, and fill it out and drop it in one of the offering boxes or turn it into to the church office. We ask for it by October the 1st. We'll take them whenever you give them to us. But, but here's the thing. Uh, after we handed this out, there was some conversation. Some people didn't like commitment cards. And maybe because they've been in churches that actually took these and considered them pledges and sent people, you know, payment due notices and stuff like that. I mean, I've heard horror stories. Can I just tell you something? That's not how we do it at Calvary. That's not how. If you're going to fill out one of these commitment cards, and I really hope that everyone does because there's a box on here that doesn't have anything to do with money that says, I commit to pray and invite my unchurched friends. I would hope that everyone wants to do that. And, 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 and here's the thing. If you're worried about us, you know, doing what we're not going to do and, and harassing you, just put your first name on there where it says name. Turn it in. We're okay with that. Because this isn't a commitment between you and Calvary. It's a commitment between you and God. We're just taking this uh, and using it for our finance team so they, they kind of know what to expect because they like to be informed. And if you're not even comfortable putting your first name on there, tell you what, just fill it out and leave it blank. Just write down, God knows. <laughs> I'm good with that. See, I don't see these cards. In fact, nobody does but the people who handle the money. And they're just going to give us a, a total amount. But here's the thing. We're, we're investing in reaching Lake Havasu City for the next generation. We're, we're building Sweetwater on Sweetwater because we want to reach your kids and your grandkids and their kids. 
We want there to be a church here that is going to make a life-changing difference in this community. And so we're simply inviting you to be a part of that, however God leads. And I'm serious. If, if you talk to God and he doesn't tell you to put down any amount, but he says you're going to, you say you're going to pray and invite friends, I'm rejoicing in that. I'm rejoicing in that. So you do as God leads you to do, because here's what I know. God gives to us so that we can bless others. And God has given each of us an opportunity, a chance to impact this community with the gospel. So are you going to go all in with Jesus? It comes down to a decision, and it's not an easy decision. I understand that. It's a difficult decision. It's a scary decision for some of you. Uh, so I'm going to close with this story. I was about 13 years old the first time I uh, went tubing down the Salt River outside of Phoenix. Anybody else ever done that here? Yeah, a couple hands. So I was tubing down Salt River and with some of my brothers and some of their friends. And, and we came to this place where there was a cliff. And some people went up there and were jumping off the cliff. And I was like, I want to do that. And, and I you know, swam over there and I climbed up the cliff. And I got on the top and I looked down and I chickened out. I chickened out. I couldn't do it. I was afraid. And, and now some of you are sitting there going, no, you were smart. You were safe. You, you, know, you, you didn't take risks. That's being rational. But the thing is, I wanted to jump and I didn't. I let fear win the day. And I climbed back down, and I swam away in shame. Personal, inside. I knew that I had failed me. And so the next time that I was there on the Salt River, and we were tubing down, and we came to a place to jump, uh, I got out, and I climbed up on, on that, uh, that place, and I jumped in off that cliff. And in fact, ever since then, every time I, I get to a cliff, and people are jumping, I jump. I do it. I've jumped on cliffs all over the world. I've jumped all over the lake. I've jumped off Copper Canyon and Steamboat and Intake and all these places because it reminds me that my life is not going to be controlled by fear. Today, some of you are on the precipice of faith and you're afraid. God is cheering you to go all in. He's saying, take the leap of faith. Trust me. Let me show you how I'm going to bless your life, how, how grace is going to abound to you, how I'm going to fill you with contentment and, and let your life be an impact. And yet the voice inside your head is saying, no, play it safe. It's not rational to trust God like that and be that generous. It's not, it doesn't make sense. Who are you going to listen to? Because God is calling you to go all in. Will you go all in on your relationship with Jesus? Will you decide today that you're going to follow Christ as Savior and Lord? Will you decide today that you're going to get baptized and declare to the world that you are a follower of Jesus? Are you going to decide to go all in and serve in a new way that you've never served before? Are you going to go all in and practice generosity on a level that you never have to this point in your life? Because here's what I know. If you go all in following God, you cannot fail and there is no risk involved. See, I made my decision. I'm going to go all in with Jesus. What are you going to do? Let's pray. Father, today we thank you that you love us and that you went all in in saving us. You sent Jesus into this world so he could suffer and die for our sins so that we could become sons and daughters of God by faith in him. And Lord, today we simply ask that we would hear your voice, that we would understand what you want us to do, and that we would have the faith and the courage to be obedient to you completely. God, thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you for your grace that abounds to us. And yes, we want more of it. And you've told us how to get it. And so, God, thank you because you are our God. In Jesus' name.